Hello, my name is uh, Vivek Reddy. I'm an electrophysiologist from Mount Sinai Hospital in uh, New York City. And uh, I'm going to speak on the, our late breaking clinical trial at uh, the Virtual HRS Symposium on the lattice tip catheter that can toggle between radio frequency energy and pulse field energy to treat patients with atrial fibrillation. I should note that I do have a conflict of interest with regards to this particular technology. I serve as a consultant and have an equity conflict with the company that manufactures this device. When we think about catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation or even particular tachycardia for that matter, most ablation technologies are performed uh, or, or employ thermal ablation, meaning the administration of energy, which either creates heat or cryo, so cold, in order to, to damage tissue. Now, the one of the issues about thermal ablation is that it is relatively tissue indiscriminate, meaning as long as the heat wave or the cold wave reaches that tissue, that tissue gets ablated. And that's fine for the myocardium, but the problem, of course, is uh, for atrial fibrillation ablation, there are adjacent structures like the esophagus, like the uh, phrenic nerve or a coronary artery, for example, which um, uh, if you inadvertently damage that can obviously have important safety implications. So pulse field ablation is a different way of, of ablating tissue. It involves the administration of uh, of high voltage electrical energy for very short periods of time, typically microseconds, even nanoseconds. But the point is it's a very short time, short enough that the amount of heat that's generated is actually trivial. So the mechanism of ablation is not based on thermal injury, but it's rather based on the fact that when you apply these very high currents for a very short period of time, that causes holes in cell membranes, which can be irreversible can be reversible at low energies and irreversible at higher energies. So the, uh, so the idea is to uh, cause this non-thermal type of ablation called electroporation because you're porating these cells. And, uh, and that's the mechanism of damage. Now, why is that interesting? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is it's very fast. So instead of talking about uh, seconds many, many seconds in order to make a single ablation lesion because of the time it takes to propagate heat. We're talking about lesions that are typically um, very, very quick, um, microseconds long, or a train of these pulses that last just a few seconds. Um, but the most interesting aspect of pulse field ablation is that electroporation can be performed in a way that you can cause relative selectivity of ablation. So it turns out that myocardial tissue is uh, more sensitive uh, to pulse field ablation than, for example, the esophagus or the phrenic nerve. So because of that reason, depending on the right amount of the, the proper amount of energy, if it's used, then you can selectively ablate the myocardium without damage to the adjacent structures. And I'm, I'm using my, I'm choosing my words carefully because I also want to point out that if it's not performed um, appropriately, let's say, then it is possible to cause damage to the esophagus, the phrenic nerve using high enough amounts of energy. So it's important to try to get to that sweet spot that you're able to ablate the myocardial tissue without the other tissue. Pulse field ablation has been used with other uh, devices uh, for AF ablation. We and others have presented this. Common to all these other approaches is the fact that these devices are one-shot devices, meaning that they're a device that's designed like a basket or a loop catheter to isolate the pulmonary veins in one fell swoop. And they're, they're all at various stages of development. What we're working on is a different type of catheter. What we're presenting is our first in human experience with a point ablation catheter. So this is a, a catheter similar to our traditional catheters it's a seven and a half French catheter. It has a tip that's a little bit bigger than most of our catheters, it's a nine millimeter mesh. Um, and the catheter is manipulated to create point by point lesions to isolate veins or to make linear lesions. Um, why is this important? Well, it turns out point by point ablation is still the preferred type of ablation in the, in the world today. About 75 to 80% of all ablations are performed in a point by point fashion. So, uh, it, it, because it allows the operator to create the lesion set of PVI wherever they want. And it also allows 
the operator create other lesions, such as linear lesions, uh, et cetera. This particular technology, this lattice tip catheter, has the interesting ability to either deliver RF energy or with literally the step of a pedal, it can switch over to PF energy. So you can deliver radio frequency energy or pulse field energy. So we presented is the is a first in human experience with 76 patients who underwent ablation with this technology, uh, using a strategy of either um, RFPF as we call it, meaning radio frequency ablation uh, anteriorly and pulse field ablation posteriorly, where where, where you, could, you may inadvertently affect the esophagus, or a strategy of pure PF, meaning PF all the way around anteriorly and posteriorly. We had 76 patients, and this is, again, the first in human experience conducted at three centers in Europe. Um, and, and the procedures were performed by, I think, 11 different operators. So a number of different physicians uh, performed these procedures. The, on the feasibility and the, and the acute efficacy side, it, was, it turned out that this catheter system was able to um, quickly perform these procedures. So the mean time for isolating the pulmonary veins was in the order of 22 to 23 minutes. So very, very quick. Um, and also selected patients underwent linear ablation, either mitral line, left atrial roof line, or cavity tricuspid isthmus line. And all of those lesions took between two to five minutes each. So they were very quick, these lesion tests, and there was 100% success in terms of achieving uh, the goal in all of these cases. Um, so again, on the efficacy, acute efficacy, it, it, things went very well. And also the performance was quite good with quick procedure times. On the safety side, um, again, it was quite good. The, the primary safety endpoint was a composite of all the various major adverse events that can occur. Uh, there was one uh, in the 76 patients, so 1.3%. And that was a patient who had a vascular complication requiring surgical repair. Interestingly, interestingly that vascular complication was on the contralateral side of where the ablation catheter had been inserted. So it was on the side where we had um, a sheath for intracardiac ultrasound catheter. There were no fistulas, no um, pulmonary vein stenoses or pericardial tapenades or phrenic nerve injury um, or strokes or TIAs. Um, in terms of other safety complications outside of the primary endpoint, there were four additional patients that had um, uh, vascular complications. Uh, none of them requiring surgical repair. Um, in addition to these safety complications, we also did two additional important types of safety assessments. Um, we did endoscopy and a significant minority of the patients, uh, actually a significant majority of the patients and 60 patients we did uh, endoscopy. Um, all of the patients where we used a pure PF approach, no lesions. In two of the 36 patients, and we used an RFPF approach, we did see some minor erythema. And when we went back and analyzed those patients, the reason was because when we were ablating anteriorly with radio frequency energy in those two patients, there was also posterior heating on the, on the catheter tip because it was so big. Um, and so what we learned from that is that if you're in a position where you have anterior contact, but also are very close to the posture, well, it's better to just use PF energy. Um, and then the final analysis that we did was we did brain MRIs in 51 of these uh, 76 patients. And what we saw were, and again, I should point out, these were all, these patients had no strokes or TIAs. We did see some asymptomatic um, uh, cerebral lesions in a minority of the patients. In five patients, we saw DWI positive or flare negative lesions. And in three, we saw DWI positive and flare positive lesions. When we looked again retrospectively at these patients, what we noticed was that in those patients that had MR positive lesions, the mean ACT, the mean first ACT was only 266 versus those that had MRI negative, it was 335. So it's very clear that it's important, well, I shouldn't say it's very clear, but we believe that uh, it's important to um, uh, keep the first ACT very high before starting the procedure, the ablation, et cetera.
So again, we were very happy with the outcome here. We had excellent performance, excellent safety. Um, but I think we have to remember, this is just what we're presenting, because this is the data that we have right now. What we're presenting are the acute outcomes of, uh, from, this, uh, from this group of patients. Uh, we still need to understand, are the lesions durable? I mean, just because we have acute isolation doesn't mean that they're necessarily chronically isolated. So it's important, or it will be important, which we're planning on doing, uh, it'll be important to do remapping studies so that we understand the durability of these lesions. And second, of course, is clinical outcome. Um, you know, it's interesting that we had done a previous study where with radiofrequency ablation alone, we had extraordinary outcomes with, six, with one year freedom from atorrhythmias over 90%. I mean, it's the best I've seen in a, in a clinical study. Um, whether or not that actually is maintained in this kind of a situation where we use RF and PF, where we have detailed um, uh, event monitoring, et cetera, et cetera uh, we need to uh, really understand that. So that is gonna be the subject of future studies.